In this video, we'll learn about intrinsic and doped semiconductors. Semiconductors are so named because they sometimes behave as a conductor and sometimes as an insulator. This allows devices made out of semiconductors to control current flow in interesting ways that are not possible with just resistors and capacitors and other linear devices. So we can make switches out of them and other interesting devices. Diodes and transistors in particular are made from semiconductors and are the basis for practically all of the interesting electronic circuits that we're going to discuss. Now, many, there's many different semiconductor materials, but silicon is by far the most commonly used for electronic components today. So we're going to focus our discussion on silicon, but a lot of it would also be applicable to other types of semiconductor. You can tell from its place in the periodic table that silicon has four valence electrons. When it forms a crystal lattice, it forms covalent bonds with each of its four neighboring atoms in the crystal lattice. Now, even at room temperature or below, thermal energy will allow a tiny fraction of those electrons to break free from their covalent bonds, producing a free electron. These free electrons can move freely through the semiconductor in response to electric fields or other forces. And as they do so, they carry current. Now that's current flow, that's in a semiconductor. And we call the free electron a charge carrier. Now I mentioned that in pure intrinsic silicon, only a very small fraction of electrons become free electrons. The precise concentration of free electrons in intrinsic silicon is governed by this equation. You can see that it depends on the absolute temperature T. There's also some material constants here, EG and B, that depend on the semiconductor material itself, silicon in this case. K is Boltzmann's constant, so that's an absolute constant. And it turns out that at room temperature in silicon, the concentration of free electrons would be 1.5 times 10 to the 10 free electrons per centimeter cubed. This may sound like a large number, but keep in mind that the silicon lattice itself consists of five times 10 to the 22 atoms per centimeter cubed. So clearly, this is a very tiny fraction. Now you'll notice, looking at this equation, that the concentration would go up as temperature increases. In general, we'll call the concentration of free electrons N. And the concentration of holes P. Now in pure intrinsic silicon, without any additional charge carriers introduced or any impurities added, then we would expect that free electrons and holes show up in pairs. So in that case, N clearly equals P, which equals Ni, which we calculated on the last slide, depending on the temperature and material constants. That is, it was 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per centimeter cubed. And we're going to be considering many situations in which a bunch of extra charge carriers are introduced into intrinsic silicon. There's different ways of doing this, and we'll talk about how that can happen later. But for now, let's just imagine that the silicon is flooded with many, many extra free electrons. Let's say orders of magnitude more than the constant Ni that we found on the last slide. So with all these extra free electrons, moving around, some of them will naturally drop into the vacancies represented by the holes. So when that happens, the charge carrier that was the hole and the charge carrier that was this free electron appear to disappear. And we end up with neutral charge there at that location in the lattice. So this process by which a free electron and a hole cancel each other is called recombination. And depending on the, it, it will occur at a, at a rate that depends on the thermal motion 
of the charge carriers in the semiconductor. So again, if there's many, many extra free electrons introduced, some will recombine with holes. So the free electron concentration will drop and so will the hole concentration. And eventually they'll arrive at a new steady state that is governed by this equation. That is the geometric mean of the electron and hole concentrations equals the value of Ni, which we said was 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per centimeter cubed at room temperature for silicon. So considering the example I just described, in steady state, the final electron concentration, free electron concentration would be somewhat higher than Ni, and the whole concentration would be lower than Ni, and the geometric mean would be equal to Ni. Now, one way to introduce extra charge carriers into a semiconductor material is to introduce impurities in the crystal lattice. So for example, if we replace some of the silicon atoms with a boron atom that has five electrons, valence electrons, then what you see is one of those electrons that was associated with the boron impurity has no covalent bond and immediately becomes a free electron. The boron impurity is called a donor because it donates this extra free electron to the semiconductor. And the semiconductor material is now called doped silicon. I should note that the dopant, in this case boron, should be introduced with a very low concentration so it doesn't disturb the crystal lattice. The material is still essentially silicon, but with just a small fraction of the atoms replaced with these boron impurities and thereby introducing these extra free electrons. Nevertheless, the concentration of the impurities can be many orders of magnitude higher than the intrinsic carrier concentration, Ni. Thus, when boron impurities or dopants are introduced, we end up with many, many more free electrons or negative charge carriers than holes or positive charge carriers. But because of the preponderance of negative charge carriers, we call this N-type doped silicon. And as described in the last slide, these extra free electrons, some of them will recombine with holes until we arrive at a new steady state uh, thermal equilibrium in the material. But again, the norm is that the concentration of dopant impurities would be quite a bit higher than the intrinsic carrier concentration of silicon. So that even if uh, you know many of the holes recombine, that would still represent a tiny fraction of the free electron concentration. So that in steady state, we can expect the concentration of free electrons in this n-type material to be approximately equal to the concentration of donor atoms introduced. So you'll notice the notation here. We said that N would typically be the symbol we use for the concentration of electrons. The subscript N here reminds us that now we're talking about the concentration of electrons in N-type doped silicon. And we're saying that that's equal to uppercase N, the concentration of donors that were introduced. And it's an approximation because as we mentioned, a tiny fraction of them will recombine with holes. The hole concentration, on the other hand, in the n-type material uh, would decrease significantly compared to the intrinsic level because many of them will end up recombining with the new free electrons in order to satisfy the equation n times p equals ni squared. Now, since we're talking about n-type doped silicon here, we can just rearrange this equation and substitute in this 
uh, approximate equality here and arrived at, arrive at this relationship uh, shown here, where the concentration of holes in n-type material is given by ni squared, which is a constant that depends on the material and the absolute temperature, and again, the concentration of donors introduced. And again, this value would be lower than what it is in intrinsic silicon. Again, since nd is generally going to be quite a bit greater than ni, then the concentration of holes and steady state is far less in an n-type material than the concentration of free electrons. Therefore, in n-type dope silicon, electrons are considered the majority carriers. and holes are considered the minority carriers. One final note, I believe I misspoke earlier when I said that the typical dopant might be boron for silicon. Uh, that's actually incorrect. It's more likely to be phosphorus. Boron wouldn't serve as a suitable um, donor. It's not in the right place on the periodic table. We can also form p-type doped silicon by introducing impurities that introduce extra holes into the crystal lattice. Now here, boron would be a suitable um, impurity to introduce in a silicon crystal lattice because it has only three valence electrons. So that's shown here. Um, so immediately, once that impurity is introduced, there'd be um, a sort of vacancy in one of the covalent bonds and that may be um, filled by an electron from one of the neighboring uh, silicon atoms. And then the hole so created may be again filled by a neighboring electron and so on. But eventually we end up with a hole somewhere in the crystal lattice as a result of that trivalent impurity atom. Now, since that trivalent uh, impurity uh, accepts an electron from a neighboring um, atom in the crystal lattice, it's called an acceptor uh, as opposed to a donor, which we saw in the n-type doped silicon. Um, and we label the concentration of acceptors that we introduce N, capital N, subscript A. Now, again, generally, the concentration of acceptors introduced would be much higher than the intrinsic carrier concentration so in steady state, we would expect to see the concentration of holes in this p-type material to very closely approximately equal the concentration of acceptors that are introduced. And again, that's because, you know, in this case, holes are the majority carrier. Um, now, again, uh, there will be some recombination that happens. It'll hardly affect the concentration of holes, but it will significantly affect the concentration of electrons. So when steady state is reached, we've got to satisfy this equa equation. The concentration of electrons in the p-type material has to times the concentration of the p-type or holes in the p-type material has to equal ni squared. Rearranging that and substituting in this expression here, we arrive at this expression here for the concentration, the minority carrier concentration in the p-type material, which is the concentration of free electrons. Um, now again, this is the minority carrier. And uh, its value would be much less than the concentration of holes in the p-type material. So I caution you that the symbol notation can get confusing here. There's obviously a lot of n's and p's running around. So I just remind you to you know, take note of the subscripts and the lower versus uppercase of each of the symbols and remember what's the, the definition of each of those terms.